Hello, my name is Arnar Thor Jónsson and uh, I am honored to have with me today as my guest Sven Ulf Wokene from Norway. And Sven Ulf is here for uh, uh, a conference that will take place in Reykjavik this week and uh, I just uh, want to uh, bid you welcome. Thank you. Uh, good to have you here in Iceland. And you will be discussing on this conference, you will be talking about what the uh, the wind turbines and the, uh, the electricity uh, situation in Norway as it has developed, right? Yeah, I guess the topic is um, is uh, wind power and um, and uh, corruption. So I will be talking in one section about wind power, and then I will take it a little bit further and talk about how it uh, how it corrupts society. Okay, so. Uh, to start this off, Svenulf, would you uh, perhaps tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in in this topic? Yeah, well, um, my background is um, I'm a geologist and I worked 30 years for a um, oil company. So I'm, um, I'm I'm probably one of the bad guys in in some people's sense. Mm. I, I retired um, uh, 12 years ago now. And uh, since then, I've been working on, um, on um, uh, informing uh, and assisting uh, local communities on wind power, basically uh, sharing experiences on what are the consequences of the wind power and what, um, will you, uh, what should you expect if uh, wind power is implemented in your uh, own municipality. Um, I'm working for an organization, um, an NGO organization. So it's all, uh, it's all. Um, I'm, I'm not paid for for anything. I've worked um, for uh, since this with for them since this it's, they started in 2019. And um, and um, as I said, it's not a paid job. We work uh, almost all of us work voluntarily. We have um, 21,000 members now. It. Uh, it's an organization that has gro grown enormously rapid. We um, we are present on most social uh, media, and we um, we can on a good day we can reach out to almost a million people in Norway. Wow. Um, so um, um, I don't know if I should say much more about my background, but I'm an advisor for this uh, organization now. I've led uh, <coughs> a number of different groups and activities, but at the moment I'm basically an, an energy advisor. So I, I write papers, uh, I write uh, articles for the news and, uh, and uh, assist people in, 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 uh, in uh, stopping wind farms when they don't want it. Okay, so <clears throat> as I as I take it, and this is my understanding, of course, that you have uh, lots of uh, energy resources in Norway. You have your uh, rivers and uh, waterfalls, etc. So, uh, when did this uh, wind farming start? When when did it when did it begin in, in Norway, and why? Well, the first wind turbines were erected in I think in 1998. They were small, and they have been pulled down by now. Um, but it really didn't take off until um, around 2010, um, when we got um, uh, when the, the Storting made a decision to subsidize uh, wind power, and then it started uh, to take off, and uh, we had a lot of um, uh, permits granted, and uh, most of these. Um, uh, wind farms uh, uh, actually ended up being built between 2017 and 2021 when this uh, the subsidies uh, went out. Mm. I got involved uh, the first time. The first time I heard about um, uh, uh, wind farms were in 2011, and uh, a neighbor sent me an email saying that uh, they're going to erect a, a wind farm in our um, in our uh, municipality. And, and it's so bad, and it, this is bad, and this is bad, and this is bad, and there's a long list of problems there in this mail. So I said to him, what, what, what is he up to now? You know, I've got to check this. Mm. So I, um, I sat down, I was still having a, a job then, 
But I sat down and uh, I uh, spent uh, like um, uh, three or four evenings, uh, late evenings working and checking into him and, and seeing if he could, could find out if he was, uh, if he was right. And, um, and after a week, I basically said to myself, gosh, this car, uh, this, this guy is maybe, maybe right, but he, he is, he is it's even worse than what he says. Because I, w I was interested in, uh, in in sound and noise from wind farms, so I started looking at that, and it was uh, I found it was um, substantially worse than what he had uh, indicated. So um, from then on, I've been uh, I've been very interested in it, and has followed it uh, uh, for uh, now. Uh, been working with wind farms for 13 years, most of the time full time. So what, what I, I guess let's if if we uh, if we try to look at this from a you know a, a logical standpoint there there has to be uh, I, I would take that there were some economical reasons or justification for people deciding to do this was it because you did not, not have enough energy was there a shortage or why was it why did it start mm -hmm. Uh, no, we have we obviously uh, we have enough energy. Um, I mean, um, uh, and we don't need to um, to talk that much about the oil and the gas. Uh, we produce um, on, on average in an average year in Norway, we produce like 150 terawatt hours of uh, electricity. In comparison, Iceland produces 14.2 terawatt hours per year. And um, we, expo we uh, use ourselves uh, approximately 134 terawatt hours. So we export uh, somewhere between 15 and 20, it varies from year to year, of course, uh, terawatt hours uh, of energy to, uh, um, uh, to Europe. And uh, one terawatt hour is a billion uh, kilowatt hours. And uh, that's, uh, I believe that's enough for 100 and for 50,000 homes, Norwegian homes. So um, we have enough energy, we have a surplus, uh, but, um, but uh, wind farms were interesting because um, um, these uh, guys, who they're, they're really opportunists uh, who uh, develop wind farms, and they saw that um, you could, in this current um, environment of the green transition, uh, a wind farm becomes an asset, uh, an, an asset that you can that you can acquire and then you can sell it, and you can make a lot of money as you sell it. Um, from from those um, from those bigger wind farms, it's uh, many many hundreds of millions of kroner in profit when you sell it to an international investor like BlackRock and so on. Mm. So BlackRock bought a number of wind farms in Norway, for example. Um, but that is uh, uh, that is basically what drives this: is um, is the desire for some to make money, plus, uh, of course, um, um, the desire from the EU to to get more electricity and to get it cheap. And um, and Norway's electricity was cheap. It's mm -hmm. no longer cheap, but it was very cheap. Um, so um, uh, uh, it's driven by, by money and uh, the government has been sort of fueling this because, because the problem has always been in Norway that um, many people are very sensible. They have learned what this is now. We have uh, in Motvin have helped them to understand, the people to understand what this really is about. And more and more people are saying no. So the government have sort of upped the amount of money that uh, the municipalities get. Uh, I don't know how many times they have actually upped it, but uh, it's we're talking five or six times. So there's more and more taxes and so on and windfalls uh, that are coming to the municipalities in Norway just to drive up uh, uh, the production of uh, wind power. And... Um, and still, most municipalities actually say no, because because saying yes, saying yes or no to a wind farm is really a question of what values you got. 
uh, are you going to go for money as your only value in life? Or are you going to, to say that nature, untouched, pristine, uh, free, beautiful nature has a value? And that's, what, uh, and that's what many are saying, it has a value. And what um, this nature gives to people in terms of life quality, health and recreation and so on, is much more worth than what, uh, uh, and, and the money, money we can get. Because the future of the municipalities in Norway, uh, especially those out on the, um, let's say the countryside, you know, on the islands and, and in the inlands and so on, the future depends on young people wanting to live there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the main thing that will attract a young couple will, who will have kids and so on is the proximity to nature. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, it's not if the municipality, necessarily if the municipality has a lot of money, but it is the opportunity to have live and, near nature and have your children grow up. Mm -hmm. in proximity to nature and have that experience in life. And that's a big value for many people in Norway. Yeah. But you say that <clears throat> you did have cheap energy in Norway. Mm -hmm. Now it has become much more expensive. Yeah. W what happened? Well, there are a number of uh, negative side effects from, uh, from building a wind farm. Norway is a small market. Um, as I said, it's, uh, we produce 150 terawatt hours. Europe is 3,500 terawatts brutto. And, um, and um, uh, wind power is a very unstable mm -hmm. power. It's really crap power because you can't put just wind power into your electric power net. It doesn't work because it's so unstable. The frequency and everything get wrecked. So there are a number of side effects. And one side effect is that you need ac access to a high price market so that you can s sell your wind power at the best possible price. And you do that by building cables, submarine cables to that market. And that's the mistake we did. We built first some connections to the Swedish and the Danish markets. And they were okay. We were still able to maintain a reasonable power price in Norway. But then, um, uh, three, three, four years ago, we started building two new cables, very high capacity cables, bigger capacity than any we have had before, 1400 megawatts, one to Germany and one to England. And of course, those two countries are the high pri highest price mar markets for, for power in Europe. So then we get connected to high price market and we import through those cables the high prices of electricity in those markets. We export our surplus and in re return we get uh, the high prices that are electricity prices that are in these markets. So electricity prices in Norway has been um, anywhere from uh, from 10 times as high as they were. That's, uh, that's uh, when the war started in Ukraine. And, um, and now they are two, maybe three, three times as high as we used to. We used to have uh, electricity used to cost like uh, uh, 35, 40 euro per kilowatt hour, which was a very reasonable price and, um, and the industry thrived on it. Uh, now, this high price is causing problems for a lot of industry. Yes, I can understand that. But this is due to European regulation that you have to have the electricity now priced the same in your country as it is sold elsewhere or what? I, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's European regulation, it's, it's the market. Yes, I mean, I mean, because you, we are now into a big, much bigger market, and yes. we get the, and and the power that the price of the power that's sold in this market, mm. it is um, the price is set by the customer who wants to pay the highest price mm. for a, a kilowatt hour of electricity. 
So so uh, they survey the whole market. How much are you going to want to pay? How much do you want to pay? And I want to pay, okay, I want to pay two kroner per kilowatt hour. Okay, then the price in that yeah. period is two kroner per kilowatt hour. Yeah. And everybody uh, who sells electricity gets <clears throat> that uh, price. Yes. So that means, uh, of course, that uh, the European, no, the Norwegian family and the Norwegian industry is paying a lot more. It's less competitive, perhaps, than they were before, right? So that they, is absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, who is benefiting? Um, who is benefiting? There are, are a number of steps. This is, is a bit like a pyramid. You have um, from, from the wind farm developers who sell their assets. Then um, there is the, um, the power dealers. They are making a lot of money on this, um, those people who sell power. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, of course, the government is also making some money on it, but it's... Um, it's well, what government make is the income from the government owned electricity which is sold in Norway. So they get the income from, um, from the higher prices because the high price in Norway also means that the nationally owned power uh, gets into the, um, the state and the uh, publicly owned companies. Uh, so I would say that um, I don't know how much exactly how much of the power is um, owned by public companies, but probably like 20, a little bit over 20 percent <coughs> today is uh, owned by by public uh, companies, sort of around, to, around uh, sorry, <coughs> uh, 80 percent is owned by public comp publicly owned company and 20 percent are private companies. Yeah. OK, so then let's say that the, the public, the publicly owned company, the energy company, Norwegian, what do you call it? What is the name of it? The publicly owned company, the biggest one, is uh, Statkraft, okay. which is the, owned by the government. And then the, the counties owns also. Uh, right. Companies. So so then uh, let's say, and I, I understand it to mean you, you to be saying that there would be some uh, profits which would end up in Statkraft, for example. Uh, what is done with this? It, is it used to subsidize the energy back for the Norwegians, or how is it done? What is done with the money? How is it used? Does it go into general funds for the general for the Norwegian state and used for something else, or how is it done? I mean, well, it's a good, very good question, and uh, <laughs> we don't know exactly what's done with all. But um, for the um, for the companies that are owned by the um, the um, counties, the money. Uh, uh, a portion of the money goes back to the municipalities that uh, mm. that owns them. Um, another portion goes into building new uh, new power and so on and investing. And a lot of bad investments are being made in new wind farms. We're we're now seeing, uh, for example, BlackRock selling out, and there is a reason for that. It's not going to be profitable right. that long, I think. But uh, that being said. Um, um, the money goes back there, and what goes to the state goes to the state, and they, uh, <laughs> yeah, w which pot does that go in? I, right. I don't they, know. They, they distribute it for whatever uh, causes they might think would be beneficial at the at that time. Yeah, that might be some somewhat like a, a, a green dream project, you know, yes. which we're going to spend a lot of money on, and that, okay. that isn't going to work, you know, and it can be anything. Could be anything. So we, we ha I asked uh, who, who benefits, qui bono? Uh, you have explained that. Uh, now, the, the, the second question would be, who is paying the price? Who is not benefiting? Who are the losers in this? Would I be correct to say that is this the, ge the general Norwegian public and the, the, the industry in, in Norway or what? That's precisely it. This is yes. a transfer of, um, of money, of value. Right from the public person, from me, from the yes. individuals to the state, which are then taking the money and using it forever, whatever, whatever they want uh, yes. to use uh, to use it for. Yes. And um, and uh, that's the big fallacy. And, and, and this transfer of money happens because we we are getting the high price. So we have to pay now the same price for our electricity 
uh, three times perhaps as much as uh, we had to pay. And that is, of course, a big extra cost. Yes. Um, for somebody who has a lot of money, it may not be that big a cost. But for somebody who has a low budget, uh, low income family, this is a huge, a huge disadvantage and a huge loss of um, value for that uh, family. Yes. Uh, because they 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 don't have they have houses that need to be heated too, and and all heating in Norway almost is um, is electricity. We don't have geothermal energy mm. like you have here. Mm. We use uh, electricity, and the vision for uh, the government and the power company is that the future is electric. Mm. Is their is their slogan, you know. So one of the results would be that. Uh, of course, as you say, the families have uh, less money to spend on mm -hmm. food or, or housing or whatever. The companies are less competitive than they were before. It costs more to produce whatever they are producing. The land, uh, a ma would I be correct to assume that huge uh, masses of land have been bought by foreign investors, perhaps in, in Norway, like BlackRock? The, the land isn't uh, particularly bought. What, what they get is um, is a lease for yes. the land. Okay. And that lease is uh, it used to be 25 years yeah. uh, with an option to extend it to tw to 50 years. Yeah. And, and, and that's almost automatic in uh, but depends on the agreement they have with the landowners. Most of the land is in Norway is privately owned. So, so you have to get a group of farmers um, who owns the land together and agree that we are going to sell this land. Some land is also owned by, um, by the state and, um, and, and it's a slightly different process. But um, 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 the landowners then gets a little bit of uh, income from this, uh, mm -hmm. from this land. And uh, the lease, they the get lease, paid. yeah, yes, yes. and okay. and that's what uh, what would entice them to uh, <clears throat> to get uh, into yeah. this, yeah. But in the, uh, the like the, in the when looking at the whole picture, the price that the landowner gets as lease is probably a a, a minuscule amount. In the peanuts, peanuts. Yeah, in in this big picture, it's yes. peanuts. Yeah. So what is the big driver then? I, I am I am just trying to understand mm -hmm. where the driver of, of you know basically comes from. I I realize there's a lot of money involved. I realize there is a lot of temptation perhaps for municipalities that have uh, debt and and not enough income. Then they are they are promised perhaps that they. The, the these turbines will come in and they will have all sorts of perhaps roads and more money you know to use for whatever they are running like schools or whatever but uh, what are the, uh, the 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 factors behind that are running this or that are that are sort of creating the uh, the temptation or the uh, or the or the um, people to think that this is a good business model for for Norwe Norwegians or for Norway? Um, I, I think very few people in Norway today are thinking that wind power is a good business model for Norway. Yeah. So the, the ones who want it is the, the power business who get this uh, income and, um, the, and the, 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 like the power, the power energy bosses, sellers or the, um, the power bosses, yes. they get a bonus when yeah. they sell. Uh, when they sell a wind farm, it can be a pretty hefty bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, um, when when the, when most of the wind power in Norway is privately owned, so the private company gets um, gets a good chunk of money when they sell it. So it's it's the 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 driver behind all of this is money, but um, um, but that leads to some some other things that we will probably discuss later on. But uh, but. Uh, uh, it is like a pyramid where, where we, the common people, are sitting at the base and we are feeding into this pyramid and the money goes up, climbs up the pyramid. Um, the uh, the uh, developers get the money, the state gets some, some, some money and the municipalities will get some money. 
and uh, and it comes out of our pockets because all the money comes out of the power price, the price we pay for power. Right. Except the sale price when um, when the uh, developers uh, sell the the wind farm asset to the international investor. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, yeah, I mean I mean the fuel for this is um, is uh, is money. Uh, I would say, put it this way, because in reality, um, it is money for the few from the many. Mm-hmm. It's money from the many from the many people to the few. And so so there are some on the top here who are who are getting rich <clears throat> and mm-hmm. and we are we, the common people, are getting poorer. yes the uh, the uh, side effects of everything. Let's say that. Uh, <clears throat> Well, you have, as I understand, you have these wind turbines now uh, reaching quite far south and quite far north as well already, right? Mm-hmm. It's on the coastline mostly, or uh, some are built in the interior also now. But yes, uh, yes it's mostly on the coastline. Yeah. Okay, so uh, are there other other uh, environmental effects from the the turbines that? you think that Icelanders should be aware of? Because there has been a lot of discussion here. And one of the things that people aggressively deny is that this has like, uh, this pollutes the uh, the environment with, you know, microplastics and everything like that. Is that a myth or? No, um, that's, <coughs> that's not a myth. Um, the um, um, uh, this microplastics come from <laughs> from the wings, and um, and in fact, microplastic uh, calling it microplastics is a uh, softening term mm. to describe what's hap- what what comes off these wings, because it's uh, it is uh, specialized substances to be maximum have maximum durability, mm-hmm. and they are full of um, all sorts of uh, poisons, uh, BPA. Uh, PFAS and uh, a lot of other stuff that uh, we really don't know very much about, and and this is being worn off the mm-hmm. turbine wings. Yeah. Now now imagine a wing turns in the in the air. It looks slow when you look at it, but for those big turbines that we are putting up today, the uh, the speed on the tip of the wing is 300 kilometers per hour. Wow. And and you can try to ride a motorcycle through rain yeah. uh, at 80 kilometers. You will be whipped in wow. the face. So this ra- this swipes to rain yeah. and to hail and to du- through dust and to uh, to salt crystals uh, that may be in the air, and this erodes the wings. So they have to be uh, uh, they have to be polished and fixed up um, um, several times uh, through their lifespan, and. Um, and uh, there is a huge debate in Norway as to how much uh, material are eroded off the wings. And and we can't get any precise numbers. But we have good people who have looked into this, who has done some research on it. And, um, and they say that we're talking about very substantial microplastic fragments if you, or microcomposite fragments that are are um, worn off the wings and sent blown off into the nature and they these are micro fragments so you can't see them you don't know know them but they get into our food chain uh, into into fish they get into the rivers and um, and the cattle will graze on it and so on and right. and we don't have good methods to detect them um, routinely detect if we are getting poisoned. So there is a question mark there as to how much it is, but we can be sure about one thing. It is not as little as the wind farm um, owners will tell us. Mm -hmm. So, and and there are other issues as well. I I understand that there is, of course, the oil that is used to lubricate the whole thing. And then the countryside is carved up with uh, roads that have to be relatively broad or wide. Yeah. If so, if I were to make a list of yes. all the problems, I, I would probably need a whole toilet roll road yes. to write wow. it down one by one because there are so many things. But but the um, the um, uh, the the biggest issue mm. or one of the biggest issues issue is the destruction of of nature in Norway. It's a brutal 
destruction and being a geologist, my background is geology, I, uh, I, ha I can appreciate how long it will take for nature to uh, recover. You, you build roads into our mountains and all the turbines um, uh, will be placed on the highest points, that is usually on the mountain tops. So the roads go up on top of a mountain top and then you have to flatten out that mountain top to make space for uh, an assembly place for a wind turbine. And, uh, and, and the size of that spot will be about half uh, a football ground, a soccer ground. Uh, so the mountain top is blasted flat. And um, with the kind of bedrock we have in Norway, we are talking tens and tens of thousands of years for this to recover. We, we, we may be talking about thousands of generations for nature to erase the scars that we make in nature. We're doing this literally forever, uh, what, what, what we're doing here. And it's just for this short period now when, 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 um, when people and the governments have been, um, been deceived to think that wind power is necessary. So, uh, um, so the, the, the destruction of nature is, is, is uh, almost absolute in a wind farm. Uh, there will be some spots in between, but when you're walking in a wind farm, you won't be going out into the nature. I've spent hundreds of hours on wind farms doing field work, taking pictures and trying to understand the impacts on nature. <clears throat> and what I find is that um, I've never seen a person walking outside a road and I hardly see anyone walking on the roads. Mm. People, people come there to see how bad it is and then they don't come back. And I fully understand that. I come back just to do my research. That's why I, I go there. Uh, so, so these areas, um, plan areas that co cover a wind farm, are, um, are, have been destroyed as recreational areas. They have, uh, they have no value for recre as recreational areas because you cannot go to a wind farm and find peace uh, unless you've got very, very special uh, nature interests. Uh, so, um, so is there a sound uh, pollution as well? or There is sound pollution. Um, when these wings swipe through the air, they make a, a, a sound. And, uh, and it's like a, this swishing sound that you often think about. But it's, um, since this sound is, um, is making a swish, it's a cyclic sound like mm. whom, whom. And, um, and um, if you're standing nearby, you'll hear a swishing sound. If you're standing, um, if you're living far away, let's say half a kilometer, a kilometer, maybe even three mm. kilometers, you can hear this sound like a more, a more uh, deep uh, sound, uh, like a bass sound. So, uh, um, so um, since it's cyclic, it's mm. very annoying. It's not like white nose noise. It's mm -hmm. a cyclic noise, and if it gets into your bedroom, you it will it will wreck your your sleep. Um, we have people who who are moving around during the night in their house to try and find the qu most quiet spot to sleep in for that night, and it can vary from night to night. We have people who have moved away from their homes uh, because they couldn't stand it anymore. Wow. Um, the property value. Uh, of course, goes down. We have now four different studies on property value, two from Sweden and two from Norway. And basically, they all show the same thing. Uh, if you are close to a wind, if you live close to a wind farm within, let's say, uh, uh, one kilometer, then the property value will go down somewhere between 30 and 40 percent if uh, if there are more than 10 wind turbines in that uh, wind, turbine, wind farm, a little bit less if they're smaller. And, um, and that effect is uh, noticeable out to 10 kilometers distance. Not so much out there at 10 kilometers, some 3 to 5 percent, but it's still noticeable in these huge statistic analyses that uh, form the basis for these um, studies. And um, of course, that is property value that is taken from the people who live there. Mm -hmm. and, and you can look at it as that is value that is taken from them and transferred into the pockets of the wind farm developers. Mm -hmm. Right. So, 
We have uh, we had a lot of discussion about, of course, electricity and prices of uh, energy when uh, we were dealing here with the third energy packet, as it was called, from the EU. Mm-hmm. Now we are, as as of course the uh, Norwegians are part of the EEA, EOS, as you call it in mm-hmm. in Norway. So there was no need, basically, for us to go into this, but this was the will of the politicians. I know that there was a case that went before the Supreme Court in in Norway, whether or not it was unconstitutional for storting it to to allow this, and uh, the, the 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 Supreme Court say that said that they this was okay, and they but they did go they had to go into you know. Uh, legal gymnastics to to reach that decision because it was a major decision yeah. that that the storting store uh, took when mm-hmm. it decided to so they so basically according to the uh, the constitution because they were transferring they were transferring Norwegian state power uh, based on the third energy packet it should have taken two thirds of the uh, of the uh, storting to accept this but they didn't have the two thirds and i think the justification that the uh, uh that the supreme court in norway used was that this was only a, a minor thing now that they had been part of the eea for so many years so much power had already already been transferred so this was just a one one step on a, on a longer journey it was something like that even though it was pretty clear that decision-making power was transferred to Acer or Acer. Mm-hmm. So, would you like to comment on that at all, or? Yes, I mean, um, I, I'm not that detail familiar with that, but um, um, but that uh, verdict was a big disappointment uh, uh, to all of us because, um, as you pre- precisely describe it, it says it's okay. Uh, but the reality is that um, Norwegian influence over our power is uh, gradually mm-hmm. being moved from Norway. We don't we control our own power, electricity less and less and less um, for every step we take towards EU. And now the fourth energy market package is lying on the table to and uh, waiting to be approved. And that package uh, will take us a very significant step uh, further. Mm-hmm. Um, that package uh, includes the, the second version of the Renewable Directive, which, um, which is one of the, it's, it's got eight different um, uh, sub-package packages, and one of them is this uh, second version of the Renewable Directive. That directive will basically um, uh, take, take us a significant step further. But the worst thing is there is a third version of the Renewable Directive that was just accepted by EU at the end of 2023. And and um, everything is set up so that that also will be accepted. And, and I've looked into that uh, uh, in some detail, what that will mean to us. And that's that will be a significant step towards um, uh, towards uh, uh, giving up control of our own power. Mm-hmm. Basically, if we accept that uh, version of the Renewable Directive uh, of 2023, then um, we Norway may, and, and Iceland too, since you are part of what we call the EUS, um, we, will, we will then uh, be committed to supporting the EU in producing renewable power until the EU is uh, climate positive. In other words, until all energy, uh, all fossil energy has been removed from the EU. And and you can imagine with laggards like Poland and Hungary, Mm -hmm. who doesn't have much renewable energy, this can take a long time. And what we fear in Norway is that uh, we could be obliged to um, uh, to produce um, um, or, or or to develop more wind power and renewable energy until 
we, may, we, might, we might reach two or three times uh, our own uh, neutrality. We are, we are now 74% uh, renewable in Norway. And you here in Iceland are, are even further on. You are the best in the world, actually, mm. when it comes to re, uh, share of renewable energy in your power system. So, um, so uh, we have um, we have this fear that, uh, and it's if you read the text, the text is very clear that uh, we will be obliged by EU to continue building wind power, building down our mountains with wind power until all of EU is climate positive. So, the, so you will be obliged in the sense that the EU. Or will take the decisions and not Norwegian politicians, or what? I mean, if we accept the um, uh, um, these directives, yeah. then these directives will become law. If if all of EUS or e, what you call it here, uh, which Iceland and um, and uh, Luxembourg is part of, then if we accept these Liechtenstein, uh, uh, Liechtenstein, yeah. certain, yeah, Liechtenstein. Then, if we accept that, then it will become law yes. in the EUS. Yes. And that law will supersede national law in yes. Iceland, yes. In Norway, and in Liechtenstein. Yeah. And consequently, we will then have to, in, in, in matters of energy, we will have to report to a uh, system that is um, that is in, in reality made by eu yes and um, when you read the, f the the third version of the renewable directive which is the, the the worst of all it is very very clear that the wind farm industry has been in there writing the text in there together with the eu government mm -hmm. there is no question about that and and they're gloating <laughs> when they're writing about it in Wind Europe, which is their European umbrella organization for, for the wind farm, uh, wind farm business, they are really so happy about this. So, so, so you know, this is not going to be to our advantage. And there are many other advantages also here. We're going to lose um, more control of the permitting process. There is going to be per, um, permits rushed through the process mm -hmm. in a year. Um, the government should design areas and say that, okay, this area is designed to be good for wind power. And then uh, in that area, you can rush permits through in a year. And mm. the maximum time for permitting is two years. Today, a wind farm permit in Norway takes between five to seven years. And that's okay. because you have to do a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, research and so on. Um, you look look at the birds. You know where, uh, what will be the consequence for the birds, for the animals, for the plants, and 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 you have a series of hearings, public hearings, so mm. that people have a say. And people need time to get used to the idea that this is uh, there is a wind farm um, here, and what it's going to mean for the community to understand what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. That time will now be basically eliminated because there will be made so many decisions, rapid decisions <clears throat> along the way. Just on that point, I just recently, uh, just today, I was publishing an article in the in the papers here, uh, drawing out the uh, the the situation that we may be facing. Is that we have the uh, the the uh, classical picture of us living in a democracy in sovereign states and that uh, the democratic procedure is the, is the way of the people to have their wo voices heard and to sort of restrain the, uh, the authorities. Mm -hmm. But there is a, uh, an author called Georg Henrik von Wright who published uh, a book in 1993 or it's, it's issued here in Iceland in 1993 called The, uh, the Myth of uh, Progress. And he's saying that there is a unity that has been formed between science, technology, and, indus and industry. And this he calls, uh, he calls this the technocracy. Mm -hmm. So that democracy is being replaced by technocracy. And that, that uh, there is uh, an, an immense amount of power and money that transforms 
that is being transferred between uh, well across borders and everything and this is seeking to this is seeking the the, the technocrats are seeking more and more power taking mm. basically control of the political procedure mm. and what you are maybe describing is how the uh, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, what we could call the 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 possibility of the general public to have any sort of influence is being shortened and limited continually uh, from five or six, seven years to what you are now saying is perhaps two years mm -hmm. for wind farms to be open. So we have to discuss, I think, having having said all this, we have to have a look at how or what is the role being played by the politicians in all of this? How are they being influenced? Why have, for example, Norway and Iceland, uh, Norway, Norwegian and Icelandic politicians been so uh, keen on accepting all of these energy packets, which we do not have to uh, uh, ascribe to? Of course, we have these uh, aqueducts in, in on the mainland Europe that we do not have here in Iceland, so we could say no to that. We have trains on the mainland Europe, which we do not have in Iceland, so we could say, well, that doesn't apply in Iceland. But then all of a sudden we have a common market on with energy on mainland Europe. And why didn't the Icelandic politicians then say, no, we don't need that because we're not obviously not connected to the European energy market. But they did want to sign it. For some reason, I'm not saying that that goes back to some sort of a big corruption, but I do think that we do have to try to understand where they see themselves in all of this. Because if it is true, what Mr. Von Wright is saying is that there is a push on behalf of the, 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 the science, the technology and the industry and the, basically the money, all of the... the uh, uh, which is pressing on the democratic process and reducing the so sovereign sovereignty of nations to decide, and this is now being big decisions being taken somewhere else, what, how can we sort of understand the picture that we're looking at without saying perhaps that uh, they are being, they are being, uh, they are not any, that they are not working anymore for their, uh, voters, they're not working for their uh, countries, they're working for someone else. They have forgotten what who they are mm -hmm. supposed to serve. Mm -hmm. How can we understand what we are facing? Do you have a, <laughs> a clarification or can you help us with that? Well, I can say that I have been thinking, spent a lot of time thinking about that. Because I, my, when I went in, into this, I was probably naive but I thought that a politician is um, elected and, and is there to do his job to follow up what the, the voters and the public uh, uh, means. And uh, that is not happening uh, in Norway. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, we are seeing, um, we are seeing uh, a very tight relationship between the power industry and our politicians. A very unhealthy close relationship, I would say. Um, and, um, and, and trying to explain, um, and, and this relationship basically means that uh, the politicians, uh, the power industry has a lot of say over our politicians, mm -hmm. but we, um, the public, don't have very much uh, uh, say. They, they don't listen to us, even though the opinion in Norway right now is that 50% of the population doesn't want wind power, wind, wind, power, wind farms. 50%? Yes. 49% okay. uh, was the last um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, poll that I saw. Mm -hmm. I, I forget who many said yes, but uh, it's uh, substantially lower because there is somebody who doesn't know. Uh, uh, what they're going to vote. So uh, basically, um, we have drifted uh, to a um, an opinion that is against wind power, uh, while our politicians have become more and more entrenched in, mm. in the idea that we are going to have wind power. Mm. 
And of course, um, to understand this, th there is of course the component of the um, of the climate and um, the idea that uh, more wind power will reduce uh, climate emissions. But nobody has ever been able to prove any link between that because when we're talking about wind power in Norway, it's always uh, practically always uh, added consumption that uh, that is going to go into it. It's new data centers. It is uh, producing ammonia, uh, which is uh, basically uh, uh, where you lose 80% uh, of the energy before you get it out again at the other end. Uh, and it's all sorts of um, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, things that um, doesn't make sense. So why are the polit politicians doing this? Well, I think I think they um, they have lost touch with the people. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, I think they are um, they are driven by sort of an ideology which may be rooted in the thinking that this is green, and um, uh, which we don't think it is. And um, I think it is um, because they are within like within a bubble, you know, and um, their minds have been captured by the lobbyists of the uh, of the wind farm and the energy power industry in general, mm -hmm. because there is a huge lobbying effort going on against the um, uh, our politicians. There are, um, for example, the leader of the uh, Norwegian uh, wind farm uh, interest organization, lobby organization, is a former energy minister, and she has like a golden card, you know, she has free access to the store thing. She can go in there and talk to anyone she wants uh, at any point of time mm. and wander around in the hallways and sit with them at lunch and so on. And um, and in addition, they're hiring the best uh, communication consultants they can get. They spend like 100 million, they have a budget of 100 million kroner per year. And uh, and uh, all they're talking about in the media is uh, is uh, facilitating wind farm development. So most of that money goes into that, even though they're supposed to work broader. broader. Um, mm -hmm. So so I think th there is this, there is an alliance here and I think uh, it's definitely between the the um, the people in the wind farm business, whether that's techno technologists or not. I'm not sure. I would think they're more more money people. Uh, they're driven by money. Uh, these people and uh, technology guys have been actually removed from the equation. We used to have a power system in Norway that was 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 uh, run by um, technical people. Mm -hmm. And their task was to produce uh, uh, reliable and affordable power for the public. Mm -hmm. Power was considered to be sort of like a staple in, in the society, a basic service in society, like uh, water, like uh, roads and so on, a basic civil service. Today, um, power has become a market Mm -hmm. a market uh, uh, thing you know it's uh, it's something you you buy on a market uh, online online with potatoes and uh, and chips and sugar and uh, tobacco and whatever you know mm -hmm. uh, and um, and it's sold in a market so it's uh, it's only driven by by those market forces and and it's those market forces is part of the thing that has found its way into into our government, into this bubble that they yes. exist in. <clears throat> so, so my father-in-law is an engineer. Mm -hmm. So he took part in raising all of these, uh, many of these hydro energy plants in, in Iceland. Mm -hmm. And he tells me that, you know, decades ago, he's now 85, they were talking to them between themselves. The tech, the, you call, you talk about the technical people, mm -hmm. people in technology. They were talking amongst themselves saying, well, what we are doing here, even though we are, you know, in the highlands, we are not with our families and blah, blah, blah. We are doing this so that our children and our grandchildren can enjoy the benefits of cheap power because this is a staple that everyone needs. So now this has been turned into a commodity mm -hmm. that uh, that is supposed to 
be uh, bought and sold in a market, right? So <laughs> you, it is difficult for like nations, uh, relatively newly sovereign nations as Iceland and Norway even, to talk about now uh, national interest and that it is necessary to guard national interests and to take care of the people of their countries and that this must be prioritized because now we are in a common market and everything has to serve a bow to the, the you know, the, the demands of that market. Mm -hmm. So that even just this is beside the point, but I want to mention it. When we became part of the EEA, we accepted, we, we, make, we made an exception that raw meat, for example, would never be imported to Iceland because we wanted to protect Icelandic agriculture and mm. that we thought that we had a, you know, a, a good uh, uh, production of meat, which, is, which is still is relatively uh, drug-free, medicated, medication-free. But, but then, a few years ago, this, was, this system was undermined when they managed to uh, take a, court, a case to court saying that, well, meat, well, that's just a commodity. And we have to treat it like any other uh, any other commodity in the market. And you cannot say that you want to protect this because of, you know, health reasons or anything like that for your mar for your population. We have to bow to the demands of the common market. So so this is has been skewed. So many things that we took for granted before have now been skewed in service of money. Mm -hmm. So this is this all comes back to who are we serving, right? Mm, exactly. Who are let let's say the the politicians, the people who are uh, taking care of business for the municipalities. Who are they serving? Where is the where comes what are, and again who is benefiting? How will the how would the uh, politicians be benefiting? I realize, Sven Ulf, I realize that they do go to conferences every year, like climate conferences. They fly to another country. There is a conference called, you know, this or that. And it's a hallelujah conference because I don't hear any debate. I only hear one-sided arguments that everything is burning, everything is boiling, and we have to do whatever is possible. So I realize, as you say, that they may be under this huge influence, like this, this, this uh, psychological influence, and they might actually believe that they're doing this in service of nature and the climate or whatever. But I do have the feeling, and perhaps I would like you to comment on that, on the money issue here and where you see the dangers of corruption coming in. Yeah, I, I look at this uh, sort of like um, a pot, yes. and you're, you're, you're making quite a devilishly cocktail in this <laughs> pot. First you put in the influence of the power industry and, uh, and that money interest. Then you put in a little bit of globalism mm. Um, mm. Uh, and, and the thinking that we should work for uh, the idea that we should work for a global good, uh, which might be good if it was that way, but that's not what it really is. Uh, and then you put in um, you put in climate and all the fear for climate, uh, uh, and 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 you stir this around, and you get a cocktail, and then you need uh, you need some um, some spice, and you sprinkle it with corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the um, the idea that you can make uh, some you can get some some benefit out of this, mm -hmm. and and I would say when it when we, if you're going to talk about corruption, that I would say there is two levels of corruption. Mm -hmm. There is what um, do you know who Eva Jolie is? Yes, she is a French uh, Norwegian corruption hunter. Yes, has worked all her life um, in that uh, area. And she says there is something called the Norwegian corruption. And that basically is like, uh, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, you know, yeah. and that's kind of, uh, that's the kind of deals that they make. Mm -hmm. make. And, and it's everything between fine dinners and, um, and, um, and uh, honorable positions. And there are also well-paid positions and, and other sort of uh, 
benefits that come out. That's the typical Norwegian Norwegian corruption. So you mean within the Norwegian system then? Yeah, this is in, in the Norwegian system, yeah. Okay. Uh, th because that's what I know. I don't know enough about the Iceland okay. or any yeah. one else, but I know what happens in Norway. And then the other level, which also uh, may happen in Norway, is that uh, there are bigger benefits made, you know. There can be sales of art and so on. Uh, you you did me a favor. Okay, I'm going to sell you this uh, art piece that's worth a million kroner. I'm going to sell it to you for 50,000 kroner. Mm. Then you can keep it for a while. You don't even have to put it in your house. You can put it in a storage house and then you can sell it for a million kroner. That's one way it can happen. And, um, and, and of course, uh, we have the tax havens, you know, and you don't know what's going on there. So, uh, so that's the second level. And, and I think um, we have seen in Norway an, 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 um, a continuous series of scandals among our storting politicians, our highest politicians in Norway. Mm -hmm. They have cheated on travel expenses. They have been dealing with stocks when they weren't uh, allowed to be dealing with stocks. Uh, and um, they have, uh, there is uh, sexual harassment, of course, like there always is in pol politics. Um, uh, and, and, and there are many, many cases of, um, of this, um, of fraud that are easily detectable, who has uh, been revealed by newspapers and uh, other actors uh, in Norwegian society who, who have been digging into this. So when this gets exposed, what are you going to think about a politician? What happens if somebody comes and says, if you secure me this uh, wind farm permit here, I'm going to give you a million kroner. What mm -hmm. happens then? I don't know. I can't say that anyone is corrupt. I would like to think that they're not, but I can't say that they aren't. Mm -hmm. And uh, But what I can do is I can talk about um, what are the risks of corruption. Mm -hmm. I can do a, I can do a risk assessment. I've done a lot of that in in my former job in the oil industry. So uh, and I'm going to talk about that on Thursday on this conference you, you mentioned. And um, and and if you do a risk assessment, then you will know a little bit more about what the risks are uh, for having corruption. And uh, and then you will also know. Uh, a little bit more about how much emphasis you're going to put into preventing corruption and uh, exposing corruption. So I think that's what we how we got to approach this. So um, so that there is some level of corruption going on here. I I have no doubts that that is happening because we're seeing so many signs on that uh, of that happening. Politicians who stubbornly in um, against the face of uh, of their um, their um, electors, they stick to one position. And it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it can make sense, but it doesn't really make sense. We see all of this going on and we wonder what it is. And uh, and it all, all adds up to that we have to start asking these questions. Mm -hmm. So would you say that all of this that you have described has it has it like reduced the trust towards, for example, the the Norwegian politicians. Is the trust in politics um, less now than it was before? Is there more corruption? It seems in Norwegian politics, well, that we know of now than we knew knew of before. I I don't know uh, how much there has been before. Maybe it's been there all the time. But the general uh, thinking is that there isn't any corruption in Norway. That there isn't? No, that's the general thinking. And, okay. and if you mention the topic to someone, uh, you will get a furious politician in front of you. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, so it's very hard to talk about it and it's very hard to, um, to raise the topic and get a, a discussion if this, whether or not this happens. And, there, and, and that again, um, uh, basically eliminates your uh, po your ability, or not eliminates, but reduces your ability to do something about it because you can't get a dialogue uh, about it because um, because of the uh, sensitivities that have arisen in society and the media has picked up on the same too. So they are very they they have to have cons very strong proof before they will say anything that can. Uh, 
can lead to something that uh, suspects uh, corruption. Mm -hmm. So, but I think we 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 have got to we have got to use a new tactic here. We got to start doing risk assessments, mm -hmm. thinking in terms of what are the conditions we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of money yeah. changing hands. Yeah. That facilitates corruption. Yes. We're seeing very poor control procedures. Yes. Or even absent control policies. Mm -hmm. That facilitates corruption. We're seeing an unwillingness to discuss uh, discuss this. And that, again, is also a factor that not only makes it difficult to expose, but it's also something that facilitates corruption because, because then you are protected if you are corrupt, you are protected by this idea that uh, corruption doesn't happen in a country. Right. So let's talk about the risk assessment now. For, mm -hmm. for like you are here in Iceland. We, ha we still have, I would say, the benefit of relatively cheap energy because we are a closed market. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we are an island not connected to the mainland, okay? The day, whenever it happens, and it can happen any day, when, when as, you know, as soon as they find, figure out a way of getting the cable to Iceland and it pays off, they will bring the cable here. And, and when that happens, we will not be able to say anymore, we, we don't want the cable, because we have signed the obligations under the EU energy law or directives, right? Mm -hmm. The, the parliament actually said, no, we have decided that this will not against done uh, will not be done against the parliament's will. But they did not make a, that statement in law. They only had like a parliamentary resolution on that. So that is makes that gives us no security. Now they are trying to change the uh, they have proposed a change to the law on the EEA agreement that uh, whatever EU regulations that may uh, talk about, well, well, that may lead to another conclusion than Icelandic law, the, e the European rules will supersede Icelandic law. So that's a huge transfer of money and of, of powers. Mm -hmm. And I would say a huge risk that we are taking because this might, the EU uh, regulations might be uh, well might not be beneficial to the Icelandic public so what I'm saying is that when we will be or if we will be connected to the the market what will happen is if, it, if the same happens here as in Norway the price will go up you know up to possibly tenfold it could, it could, yeah. I, I mean, the reason we are tenfold in Norway was uh, because of the Ukraine war. But if a crisis like that happens, uh, yes. uh, it would, uh, it would do something like that uh, to us, and we would be attached to. Yeah. You would be attached to it. Yes. Now, so that is a risk assessment that the the politicians would certainly have to make. Yeah. I would think. Yes. Um, I mean, you you need to look at the scenarios. You know, what could happen? You know, if this and this, and what would be the impact upon us? if this and this happen. But regardless, um, well, I don't know what the power price is in or is in Iceland. So, yeah. so I, I, I can't say for sure if it, it's going to be more, but you'll certainly be linked to the prices in um, uh, to the market and the yeah. prices in in um, EU. Uh, what's more? Uh, there is not just one way you, your power market can get linked to the European market. Yeah. There is another way too. Yeah. And that's called hydrogen mm -hmm. and ammonia. Mm -hmm. And hydrogen and ammonia is basically that you take the power you produce here and you produce uh, hydrogen. Uh, normally it's converted into ammonia, but you have to produce hydrogen first and you can then just use the hydrogen as it is, but it's very expensive to to transport because it needs to be cooled and, and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, but then you convert, combines hydrogen to nitrogen, which you pull out of the air. And then you um, send, you get ammonia. And, and that ammonia can be tapped on a tank and sent to the EU. Okay. And these factories uh, that produce ammonia can sit there and suck up 
all the electricity in Iceland. And then it's the market price of uh, ammonia in Germany that wow. will, will, will rule your power price wow. here in Iceland. So um, if you start developing a lot of wind power here, yes. um, then, um, then you will need an offtake of that wind power. And that offtake uh, must almost certainly be, um, be uh, uh, ammonia because you have got so little balancing power here. Yes. You have got 14.2 terawatts of electricity. And I bet you much of that is uh, river electricity produced out of your rivers, yes. which, uh, which run at certain times of year, and then they don't run at the other time of year. So you can't rely on that being there all, all, always. Mm -hmm. What you can rely upon is, uh, is uh, when, when, when you produce electricity out of a big dam and you've got a large reservoir of water that you can tap and, and, and regulate uh, mm -hmm. the power production mm -hmm. continuously based upon. Um, uh, and balancing problems um, in your electricity system will start occurring at around 20%. And then as you increase, they will get bigger and bigger. And, 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 and they can be handled, but it costs money to handle. And guess who pays for that money to handle the, ba the cost of the balancing the electricity system to allow a significant amount of wind power be put into the, the, it's the into public. The, it's the public, yeah, because that comes back to the electricity price. So, would, so are you saying that whenever the uh, the wind uh, turbines uh, will be uh, erected, that uh, we uh, will be facing a, a, a perhaps a whole a whole new situation with energy prices and with and how these this energy will be used. If you if you get ammonia factories and a link to the Europe, yeah. then you will have, have the energy price uh, problem. Um, if you get um, if you get ammonia, yeah. you will have the energy price uh, problem with without the link, without the without the link. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You will also have the the energy uh, price uh, but, problem, but but, it, but that, then it depends on the pri cost price of ammonia. But right. the ammonia price mm. is driven by the price of electricity right. because that's the base thing that you put into producing it. Yeah, but then they would probably say, well, you don't have to worry about ammonia because we're not going to pr be producing ammonia. We will just be feeding this into the grid uh, mm -hmm. normally. What would you say to that? Those uh, well, you can you can handle up to a certain level of wind power in your grid. Yes, we have um, today we have uh, we have on average uh, sort of fifteen terawatt hours of wind power. That's ten percent of the total national production. Fifteen terawatt hours is uh, wind power produced annually. In addition to that, we have also a good deal of river power, which is also unstable energy. So uh, stable power. So I don't know what the exact sum is of those together, but let's say it's uh, around 20%. It's around mm -hmm. 20%. And, um, and that's 20% unstable power. And the Norwegian Energy and Water Board, um, two years ago, wrote a very interesting report saying that uh, we are, um, for the first, uh, we are now approaching a situation where we will have to think very carefully about balancing um, this unregulated power, whether it comes out of the river or whether it comes out of the um, out of the wind farms, and in particular, the wind farms are a problem because it goes up and down and up and down all the time. Yes. So, ra does that raise the price of energy in itself? The cost of balancing will will raise the cost of energy. Um, so, um, and, and balancing costs are normally put into the energy price. Uh, um, so if you don't have a cable um, which is going to control the price, then, uh, then it will, uh, will clearly increase your price regardless because is you have to start uh, paying money for balancing. Somebody's got to pay that and that's going to be the customer. Is it because the, 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 the wind energy is more expensive than hydro? energy um it's because of the instability of the yes. wind energy 
uh, yes. because every time you get a low pressure sweeping through Iceland and they come all the time like just like in Norway I presume mm-hmm. yes so so then you will have a uh, you will have a high production peak and you produce at your maximum for um, for a day or maybe mm-hmm. some hours yes and then um, then you will have a, have some na- nice days maybe you'll you will have a week of nice weather mm-hmm. and then you won't they won't produce mm-hmm. so Iceland is so small also that um, you you don't have like Norway. We may have a different energy uh, weather system in north and south, mm-hmm. but in Iceland you will have the same energy system on the whole island. So it's going to go up and down, and and there won't be any kind of regional compensation for uh, for wind farm production. So you will ha- definitely have a significant uh, balancing problem if you uh, start producing a significant amount of uh, wind power mm-hmm. um, relative to the power that you currently produce <clears throat> from uh, from hydro hydroelectric power mm. now the uh, the uh, uh, we have a company here which is owned by the state basically it's called Landsvirkjun mm-hmm. uh, it's 100% owned by the, the, the government as mm. i say and then people fear that or many people fear that once the uh, wind turbines have been you know built that they will uh, be used as as uh, as a method or a, or as an excuse to sort of uh, take uh, Landsvirkjun, the state uh, energy company, apart and sell it on the market, sell it to whoever bids. Do you have a? Do you can you can you share with us any any Norwegians uh, Norwegian uh, view on that? Well, there, there is certainly going to be someone who wants to do that. Yeah, uh, uh, that is for sure. I mean, in um, um, in Norway, we haven't seen uh, too much uh, of public companies uh, being sold to um, foreign companies, but we have seen a, a good deal of of um, publicly owned, uh, or not a good deal, but some. Uh, hydropower being sold on the, to private uh, investors, um, but but I think there there is a push towards doing that. We're we're seeing a um, a consolidation of um, you know each region has a regional power company in Norway. Yes, and we're seeing a consolidation where they are putting together companies to make bigger units. Mm-hmm. And normally, uh, that can be because um, it's more efficient, of course, but uh, also that's a warning sign that somebody is building bigger units that are easier to sell on the international market. Mm-hmm. And there certainly is a market for um, for selling um, power companies if the government should choose to do so. Uh, what we're also seeing in Norway is that... Um, the uh, wind farm section is being split out from the publicly owned companies. Mm. So, uh, and they're giving these companies uh, names that are almost uh, uh, illegible, like uh, Aneo and Eveni and, and so on. And these companies, they are, um, are then sections of these bigger companies that are purely devoted to, um, to uh, developing wind farms. Again, that may be a sign that something is, um, some reorganization is going on, uh, but I don't know exactly what that uh, is going to mean, but, um, but it should be a warning sign when you start uh, seeing a, a consolidation. Obviously, you don't have that here because you've got a much smaller energy market. But uh, you cannot be safe um, for this. And, <clears throat> and if you have politicians that go against the grain of what the public thinks uh, and, and who can do that, then, uh, um, then things like what has happened in Norway can happen also in Iceland. We haven't sold uh, the power producing companies, but what we have sold out is the power exchange Yes, and 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 when Norway had that power exchange, we had a, a large, a much higher degree of control on the on the power prices in Norway. Yes, now it's been sold to Euronext, and Euronext is a European um, uh, power exchange, which uh, which uh, we now have to buy the power from. 
So we produce, um, Norway produce now uh, hydropower. Most of the power in Norway is hydropower. We produce hydropower for um, uh, 12, 13 euro um, in Norway uh, for production cost. And then we buy, we, the public, buy that power back from this power exchange for perhaps um, uh, one krona as a wow. hundred euro or, or 200, two krona, 200 euro. Wow. And it costs uh, 12, 13, 12 euro to produce. Wow. So, Svenulf, when we now bring this to an end, mm -hmm. uh, you have been looking at this for years. What advice could you give us, the Icelandic people, now that we are in the discussion phase regarding the wind turbines and the energy grid? What could you say to us? I think the first thing is to um, is to become aware, make yourself aware of the consequences of what you are getting into, because because this is going to impact you for the rest of your lives, maybe f for for a hundred years onwards. What you do now with your energy, your energy is your most important um, uh, uh, most important uh, base factor for your industry, for your lives next to, to, of course, to yourself, which is the human resource. So I think uh, I think you need to understand, make yourself, uh, uh, listen to the, exp uh, or introduce yourself to the experience you had in Norway and um, understand what's happened there and then see how does that apply to you here in, in Iceland. Everything won't uh, apply directly, but uh, many things uh, will apply. Um, and then I think you need to um, develop a group, a group or several groups in Iceland who will work on informing, uh, on, on sort of being a, a source, a focal point for that information, because I doubt that your government is going to give you that uh, holistic and, uh, and, and good information. I don't know your government, so I can't say, but in Norway, we would never doubt, uh, we will never let the government rely upon the government. We don't trust them, basically. Mm. So um, um, my suggestion would, would then be to, um, to, uh, um, uh, uh, to understand this and then have a, a good public debate mm -hmm. about the pros and the cons of doing this mm -hmm. uh, based on the full experience from Norway. And if you want to build a group, uh, I might suggest, and, and maybe I'm biased, but, uh, but there is already an, uh, an uh, organization that has um, started a little bit here, which is called Motvinder Iceland. And uh, that's so far, it's just a Facebook group. But um, find people in that group who uh, find people who are willing to dig and work along with the public to inform them, just like we are doing in uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Svenolf, many thanks for uh, the, our uh, conversation. Thank you for coming here. I look forward to your lecture on Thursday. Well, thank you for having me. I've I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Talk for it.